All right, cool. All right, everyone's gonna be staring. Everyone's gonna be looking over there. Look yeah, I know. Right? Looking at you, looking at the giant. Yeah, I, I, I can, I can do this. I can like hide down here, and right. then, and then I'm not directly. Don't worry. <laughs> for the good. past like month, we've had enough giant James Chen heads all over campus. <laughs> like, kind of used to it's kind of weird. I just walked by and I saw my face on the wall, and I was like, no, this is not good. <laughs> Why are you terrorizing your students here? <laughs> All right, so I'll, I'll just do a brief introduction, pass it off to James. James is a sports commentator for eSports. He's mm -hmm. done a lot of work with Evo. Just this last weekend, we were at one down in Tucson. Yeah. Rewired and watching fighting games and watching him do the commentation. And so mm -hmm. he's pretty much here to talk a little bit about the idea of as game makers, designers, etc., us building for spectation, for yeah. spectators, for people who watch the game, not necessarily people who have a controller in their hand. And then mostly it's going to be question and answer. Any questions mm -hmm. you have, anything you want to know about what it's like living the wildlife <laughs> of esports commentary. Right? It's not that exciting, but you know, it's fun. No, it's if fun. You want to go out and see like his golden Porsche from that he makes from the movies. Right, he gets right. From, yeah, the the esports e pennies is what we call them. <laughs> so <laughs> you can do that. We're well, getting. I'll let you have it. Sure, no problem. So, yeah, my name is James Chen. Uh, I go by the nickname uh, Jay Chenzor. Uh, that's what. Uh, well. People used to call me that, now everyone just calls me James Chen because my actual name has less syllables than my nickname. <laughs> so it's actually easier just to call me James Chen. But uh, mostly, uh, I just kind of want to start by uh, just having a, like a small little talk here, mostly because it's really interesting because, you know, growing up, I've been playing video games for, God, how old am I now? I don't want to reveal my age. I've been playing for a very, very long time, since I was five or so, you know. So I was playing just in the arcades and, and uh, you know, it's really interesting because video games have always been this kind of thing where you play and you're by yourself and you're playing and, uh, you know, or you're playing with friends and stuff. But what's actually starting to become really interesting about video games these days is, be is that video games are slowly becoming more and more of a spectator thing. Like, you know, you see a lot of people, you know, with tw with the rise of Twitch, right? So Twitch is getting really big. Everyone's always watching video games on Twitch. It's not even competitive games necessarily. It's like you just watching someone play through Dark Souls, right? And you're just having fun watching them die over and over again. And it, it's really interesting because it really is becoming more of a spectator thing and I've heard the, the, the phrase from people like why would you watch someone play video games that doesn't make any sense but it's just the same thing why would you watch anyone play basketball or anything right it's just if there's persons entertaining or if they're good it's just something that's fun to watch and so like nowadays we have what esports right so we have for example I'm I'm mostly versed in fighting games so I mostly am uh, really whoops did you I'm looking for an eyeglass case oh yeah no problem uh, I don't see anything over here. No, sorry. Okay. All right. Thank okay. you. Yeah. No problem. Um, but you know, with the rise of esports, obviously that's a competitive game, and people are starting to watch that, like traditional sports, or I always like to call it a sports, athletic sports, you know, <laughs> as opposed to esports. But um. Uh, you know, like I said, people are watching on YouTube, they're watching Let's Plays, uh, you know, they're watching people stream on that. There's, and like, like I said, Twitch is really huge, and then even something like uh, Games Done Quick. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you guys watch a lot of the Games Done Quick uh, marathons that they do uh, twice a year. And so, yeah, it's, it's just really interesting to me now that video games are becoming something that people watch. And up to this point, I don't feel like people have really designed games in a way that's supposed to be spectator friendly, that they're not designing video games to be this thing that people are watching. It's always supposed to be a very immersive experience for just the player. And you know, while a lot of games like Dark Souls, I mean, I don't think you need to add anything too much to that game to make it more spectator friendly because you're literally watching one person's experience through the game. It really kind of changes once you do start getting into that esports world because now you're starting to watch competitors play. You're starting to watch people play against each other. And you know, even when you watch traditional sports on TV these days, uh, there's always a very different informational viewpoint that the play that the spectator has than the actual people themselves and so I feel like this is actually starting to some starting to be something that if you are trying to make an eSport because a lot of a game that's designed for eSports because this is definitely something that uh, 
as esports gets bigger, a lot more people are like, I'm going to make the next best competitive game. I'm going to make this awesome esports game. And so as that keeps growing, you know, this is a new consideration that I feel like that a lot of people are going to have to start, you know, building into the game, thinking about how to do that. And so um, just a little bit on my background, uh, you know, uh, Hugh uh, introduced me as, you know, a commentator. I've done a lot of commentary for fighting games. Uh, I don't know, has anyone here watched EVO before? Like EVO? Yeah. yeah, okay. So I've helped with like EVO. I'm going to be doing uh, Capcom Cup that's coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, that was just like the year-end big championship for that. And uh, yeah, I've been commentating fighting games like for maybe like six years now or so. And you know, it's interesting from my point of view because I used to be a player. So as a commentator, when I'm watching the matches, I can kind of talk about things like, oh, this is what you should be looking for and such. And, you know, fighting games are a little bit more easy to watch than a lot of other games because all the information is on the screen. But what's going to happen is you're going to start creating competitive games where not all the information on the screen. In fact, a lot of first person shooters are that way. You know, a lot of MOBAs are that way. These games are designed with uh, hidden information. And so, um, you know, I just kind of want to talk about, from my experience as a person who likes to watch competitive video games and who has fun with that, just kind of want to talk about a, a few things that I feel like that can help you when you're trying to design something for an eSport that's actually going to be uh, meant for spectators more than, more than even just players. So um, the one thing that I'm really big on is just making everything as clear and concise as possible, just like clarity. So when people are watching the game, they know what they're seeing, you know, so that there's very little confusion. One of the uh, examples that, you know, that I, 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 I've managed to play this game recently. Uh, it's just a beta version. So uh, I was playing it and it's a really fun game. It's kind of like a capture the flag kind of game where there's like two four man teams and they're trying to grab an object and, you know, carry it around everywhere. And from each person's playing view, so from the eight players, they know exactly what's going on with their character. So like, I'm here, I'm trying to attack this guy, knock the flag out of him so I can grab it and I can start running. But then they just unveiled it recently and they showed an exhibition stream of it. And they showed like a third person camera view of the whole entire thing. And what ends up happening is like you have eight people all like gathering to this one item and then stuff happens <laughs> you know it's like you're watching it and you're like I'm not sure what happened I just know that this flag got knocked out this guy's got it now he's running and then like they're just kind of uh, it's 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 not particularly clear and so what I saw a lot from the twitch chat people were like I don't know what's going on you know like oh, this doesn't look that exciting and such but as I said when I was playing it it was I, I played it and it's really a fun game and so now this starts introducing this new concept here, right? So you can make this game fun for players, but when you want to design it for an eSport, now you have to make sure it's something that people can understand when they watch it because they might not actually ever play it. So um, I kind of have two categories of ways to do this, and they're kind of divided into this public and private information. So the public information, which is the in-game information, is stuff that everybody is supposed to know. So this is public stuff. So whatever you see on the field, everything that's been going on there, and you can do a lot of things to make it very clear to spectators through visuals and through audios. And like, um, you know, for example, uh, you know, if you're playing something like uh, League of Legends, right? You have your standard attack, you also have your special attacks, you have your ults and everything like that. You want to make sure that when you're doing something special, like if you trigger an ult or if you use one of your uh, one of your abilities, that visually it's very clear what's happening, and you want it to make it look special. Like if one of the League of Legends characters, their just regular attack is like this big, giant, flashing, bright thing, and then their ult is like you can't see anything, then you don't you're not conveying this proper message to the people who are watching it. You know, the people playing obviously know the difference because they're the ones playing, they're the ones controlling it. But from a spectator view, you need to present that kind of information to people so that they can inherently understand it. Um, another one, and this one is, uh, I think is kind of really important, actually not as obvious, is audio cues. Like, uh, since I'm a Street Fighter player, you know, like, everyone remembers, you know, Haruken, you know, Shoryuken, you know, you always remember these sound bites. 
And the cool thing about it is those are special moves. They require special combination, you know, joystick motions. They do chip damage. You can combo into them. I can go into all sorts of wacky detail about that. But um, because they have that audio associated with them, as a viewer, every time you hear that, you're like, oh, that's that one move that they're doing that's really powerful. And they get that association with it. Uh, I don't know, is there a lot of Tekken fans in here? You guys play Tekken at all? Um, Okay, so we got a few. Um, so, as a person who likes watching fighting games, I have trouble watching Tekken, to be honest. Like, I watch it, and that's because all the moves kind of blend in with each other. They don't actually say anything, you know? Like, they don't make any noise. Like, they don't have these verbal cues. Um, when uh, I One of my favorite games to watch is Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3. That's a really fun fighting game. But, you know, it's with all the Marvel characters, all these Capcom characters, but there's all this dialogue. And it's really cool, like, Bionic Commando, one of the characters, when he grabs you with the super, he, you know, at the end he yells, this is it! And he, like, punches you. And when you're watching in an audience, everyone chants that. And it's really funny when Karen uh, in Street Fighter V hits you with the super, she does this laugh, which she just again goes, oh! You know, that kind of laugh. And everyone in the audience mimics it. You know, it's these it's these audio cues that really help. And like Mortal Kombat, I've always felt was kind of tough to watch because they had the same problem as Tekken. You don't get a lot of people saying anything. But what does everybody remember from Mortal Kombat? Is get over here, right? Like everybody remembers that even to this day. And it's because that was the only audio like dialogue that was repeated so much. Even, even something as like trivial as you know the, the little toasty head that popped up in mk2 you know i don't know if any yeah <laughs> i don't know if anyone played i don't know i'm, I'm revealing my age here because mortal kombat 2 you guys are like, two what that was like when i was like six years old so but you know those kind of things i feel like help a lot so like in that game that i was talking about recently um, you know, I think it would help a lot if the characters shouted certain phrases. In fact, even in Overwatch, right? Like, right now, what is, everyone always quotes, it's high noon, right? As soon as you hear that, you know something's happening. And, like, everyone kind of like, oh, great, here, 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 here it comes, right? So those kind of things, I think, actually really help spectator standpoint. So it's, it's really kind of emphasizing certain things, making sure that special things stand out. And I think that helps a lot from the public standpoint. So this is the, the, the in-game public information that everybody knows. So even if there are multiple people playing Overwatch, you know, everyone's going to hear it's high noon. Oh crap, here comes the ult and I better make sure that I can try to live or something like that. So this is the public information. What becomes interesting is that there's also the private information that's more just for spectators. So this is where you start adding things on top of the game itself to help spectators. And the best way to give an example of this is just using TV, right? So sports that we're watching right now. So for example, um, I always thought it was funny because I, I used to play uh, Blitz, NFL Blitz in the arcade. And they put this little yellow line there to show you where the first down is, right? And so when you, I mean, that's most football games, they have that. They've put that to TV now. So when you watch football, there's this yellow line that's on the TV camera that's telling you where the first down is. But the players themselves can't see that. None of them know where that is. So that's a spectator information, right? So that's something for spectator. Uh, they used to broadcast poker on TV and nobody, it wasn't fun to watch because you never know what anybody's cards are. Then they added the poker cam and then they put the percentage of chances of people to win in poker. So they're giving the spectators information, right? Um, another example I have, uh, NASCAR, if you watch NASCAR, they actually have the driver names that follow the car nowadays. That's like new technology that they put on there. And so uh, these are all really, really, uh, excuse me, important things. Even when you're a spectator and you're watching basketball, like you can see someone sneak behind the other person and steal the ball. Like the person who had the ball doesn't see them, so they don't have that information, but the spectator has that information. So that stuff starts becoming really important. And one of the examples I like to give uh, for games that's been doing that really well is uh, I was watching a Counter-Strike tournament recently and I was watching the view and you can see all the opponent outlines even if they're behind walls and everything like that. But that's only spectator view, right? So that way, as the spectator, when the player, you see their view and they're running around the corner and you see the silhouette behind the corner, you're like, oh man, he's just gonna get shot as soon as he walks around this corner. That 
helps build that story for the spectators, but the players can't see that. So there's two separate ways to do that. And the, the interesting thing about that one is that I don't know if that works as well with console gaming. This is probably more for a PC kind of gaming kind of thing. Right, yeah. Right. Halo Call of Duty have like silhouettes around players with their uh, spectators. Oh, okay. Do they? Okay. Even on console. Oh, okay. Because they have a spectator view that people can connect to. Okay. Because I was thinking like multiple monitor views kind of thing like that. But uh, so they have it so that you can watch online matches. Okay. Yeah. So there you go. So these are really important things to have to help. And then, you know, uh, the other obvious example is like. Uh, League of Legends, StarCraft, you know, there's the fog of war for the players, but then for the people, they can just see the entire map. They can see exactly what's going on, right? So this is, those are the two kind of ways that I feel like really help make a game much more watchable for people. It's the, the in-game stuff you have to, that everybody knows, you really have to emphasize so that everything is distinct, so that people who are not familiar with the game can follow along with it. And then there's the extra, the hidden information that's supposed to be private between players that you can show to just the spectators so they can understand what's going on. Um, I'm a little biased because I'm a commentator, so I added an extra category of like commentator views, like an extra thing that maybe we can, I know I talked to Hugh about this a bunch. You know, he was saying like, he was just at the Rewired event this weekend and he was like, man, it would be really cool if you could have had a separate screen that showed you like, oh, this was a proper punish or this was this information or here's all this data over here. And yeah, that would be really super cool. So for example, um, if I'm watching a first person shooter, I would just have the overview map, and so I can see where all the positions are and everything. Yeah. I was gonna say that uh, I know that League of Legends actually does that for their casters too. Mm -hmm. Where in League you have like the runes and the trees, which you said is like behind the scenes. You don't right. see that as a viewer. Uh -huh. um, but the, spe uh, the, the um, shock casters can actually see that on the side screen. Right. Also can see active damage being done in game. So if you know they're discussing something, they can bring up the fact that like say this person's done this much damage, this person's other. You can mm -hmm. they can make a comment about yeah. how this person is yeah. carrying their weight in the mm -hmm. fight center. And the same thing goes to show if, like, they're running something out of the ordinary as far as, like, a rune set or something like that. Right. Because he's wanting, you know, 5% crit or something <laughs> random like that. They're right. Like, they would point that out and give that to the audience. And, like, a, that's, like, part of the thing is conveying the information that you don't have right in front yes. of your face. Yes. Uh -huh. so, like, exactly. the audience understands. Yeah. And then explain why it works that way. Because if all that was on screen, it would get really cluttered. And exactly. Happy. Exactly. And, you know, I actually have that right here in one of the bullet points. Like, it helps build the story. So for a commentator, I can be like, oh, okay, yeah, this person is not carrying their weight. Or, hey, look, they're trying to approach the enemy, you know, base by going around this way, you know, just having that kind of information. So um, that's definitely something that, you know, is definitely new. Like, I don't think anyone until maybe League of, well, probably StarCraft and League of Legends, you know, trying to build these commentator views into their game so that people can tell these stories. But previous to esports, that never had to be something that you were thinking about, right? So this is just, it's almost kind of like a, a foreign concept in a, in a lot of ways that I just don't think um, is something that people talk about a lot. But now that we're in this era where people are watching, you know, video games as a sport, I think it's become very important. And um, yeah, so I mean, I don't want to go on too long. I want to leave some time for some questions and everything like that. So I just kind of want to uh, just summarize, you know, really that in order to make a good game for being uh, for for esports it really needs to be fun to watch it really needs to be engaging and it has to be understandable and clear to see what's going on i mean that's one of the advantages of a lot of you know uh, sports these days on tv right so even if you don't know about like three second violations or pick and rolls or whatever in basketball if you see someone dunk the ball or you see someone shoot the ball and it goes in the hoop you know they're doing something right so when you're making a game for esports, that's something that you want to do is make sure that it's very clear what's going on, what everyone's goal is, so that uh, people who aren't familiar with the game can watch it and know what's going on. Um, it's interesting, I had a discussion with someone recently and they were talking about how they felt like uh, games like StarCraft are not are just not going to be able to make a comeback because recently like the there was a the Korean league just shut down recently and so he my, a friend of mine was saying that he didn't feel like that RTSs could come back because they're too complicated to watch because it's just like a bunch of tiny little mini life bars going around here and then stuff is going on all over the place and it's really hard to watch and um, I mean I think that you could probably do it so that it does work uh, yeah, I, say, I, I can kind of agree, agree with that in mm -hmm. the sense that, like, if, as a player, like, if you play the game, obviously you can understand everything. Right. right? Uh, uh, I always look at it as, like, 
Yeah, my mom or dad comes in and watch them understand this. Right? <laughs> yeah. For most for most like FPS is like capture the flag. You could like, mm -hmm, understand mm -hmm. that concept. But for like an RTS, like I couldn't imagine my my dad sitting down and watching Starcraft right. and remotely understanding. It. Unless obviously mm -hmm. you have catchers and they can try to explain it. Right. Like, exactly. Uh -huh. it. And that's like the caster's job, I think, sometimes. Whether it's either a color caster versus like an analytical um, mm -hmm. caster, whatever the deal is, you know how that goes. But that's where I see it. So. Okay. Well, I'll. Go with you I would say, well, I think conceptually it's, it's pretty easy to understand. It's just the minutiae and like details that get mm -hmm. kind of hard to convey. Mm -hmm. But I think that StarCraft is actually one of the better RTSs at conveying that information okay, okay. comparatively to like other things. But um, it, it's basically you destroy the other team's base and you win. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, you deny them the, their expansion, you win. Right. And, and and you can clearly see usually by especially if they're playing different races. If not, it's just colors, and you can clearly differentiate who each other is. Mm -hmm. And when the battles break out, you don't know all the exact micro details. But you don't really know the exact micro details of certain things, like in other games. Either. Right. And it's more yeah. about just understanding how that goes on. I thought actually, I, I don't agree that Stark. I, I think RTS is winning. Yeah. Like, especially, I think the games create the most competitive environment. RTS mm -hmm. is doing because of the strategy, the strategy aspect. Right. And I think that when you look at Starcraft, it's actually from a spectator experience isn't as bad to watch. I mean, yeah. I did play the game, so I'm a little bit right. Better, but <laughs> it has. Um, I think it has enough to do with like you know. Red versus blue. Right. And units shooting each other. Whoever wins, wins. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, when my friend said that, I actually... I actually personally don't agree. I think RTSs can easily make a comeback, but if they... And especially because, I mean, look what uh, Blizzard's doing with Overwatch and stuff. Like, they've just made it so appealing and so visible and viewable so i just feel like you know they can probably do the same thing for an rts if they come up with this perspective you know with this idea now to try to make it more viewer friendly i definitely think they could come back with that so yeah um i can definitely see uh where your friend would get that opinion because mm -hmm. rtss have definitely fallen behind yeah in the previous years not just as a spectator sport but mm -hmm. also as just a competitive sport mm -hmm. and just as a game genre itself um, you see more and more, or I should say fewer and fewer RTSs, um, and then the ones that do come out are more and more advanced to try to reappeal to those people. Right. Um, however, uh, there are a couple games that are really looking good that may bring it back. Okay. Um, okay. A good example would be Halo Wars 2. Um, mm -hmm. 343 Industries has kind of made the Halo shift from just a fun game that you can play with your friends to. Uh, competitive esport that was their whole nice. goal of Halo 5. Um, so to see what they do with Halo Wars 2, since mm -hmm. they have that mindset, I think it, it could definitely yeah. re spark that uh -huh. in the esports viewing community, um, especially if they incorporate spectator modes like they did in Halo right. 5. Uh -huh. where exactly. You can come in as a caster in your own mode and kind of view what you want to instead of just mm -hmm. the perspectives switching exactly. from HDMI to HDMI. Yeah. Um, so I think that would definitely be one for your friend yeah. to watch because yeah. personally, I grew up on RTS. I love it, but it's <laughs> yep. been very sad for me in the last five, six years to see fewer, fewer RTSs. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that that one might actually spark something in it. it yeah. Looks, like, yeah. I, I, I think MOBAs are partially to blame for the downfall. Yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I love League of Legends MOBAs, but right. they definitely contributed to the. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's yeah, pseudo-similar. I mean, they, yeah. they, they came from an archive. Right, yeah, so. exactly. So, yeah. Okay. Is there... Have you seen anything, um, speaking of age, uh, that the Voobly community does with Age of Empires 2? Mm -mm, no, I haven't so seen it. So Age of Empires 2 is still actively played. Okay. Um, what, 15, 20 years later. Um, but the Voobly community actually built an overlay that they can use, mm. and it puts a different interface over top of the game shows you every player, shows nice. you their villager account, their military account. Up on the right hand side it'll show you what each person's researching at that time. Oh, cool. and you can really follow the strategies that are going on with the people because you can see, oh look, these four players are researching fletching. So right. they must be going for this strategy. And that, okay. Like you said, that added layer of information, those streams are much more fun right. to watch than somebody's just showing of Age of Empires 2 yeah. game. And that interface uh, that they've created and mm -hmm. it's customizable it, it lets you see eight players are playing at once, but I can see. Oh, right. Look at he. He must be slinging because he's doing this and this, but he's doing this. Yeah. And, and, and you mentioned for archers or something like that. And you mentioned that the game was like what, fifteen years old? Yeah, you said yeah. Two was what? I can't remember. Yeah. It's it's about, <laughs> yeah so I mean, so it's like nineteen. Yeah, so it's like it's different now. So like, if they made it now, they would build that into yeah, there right yeah, away. It wouldn't take extra people. Cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah exactly. Exactly. That, exactly. That reminds me of uh, Starcraft One as well. Brood War. Uh huh. Yeah. Still huge in Korea. 
if you go look at like all the PC bangs and stuff, mm -hmm. like it's still number three, and it's already behind like League of Legends and, and Overwatch. Overwatch right? Yeah, so, like, <laughs> Brood War is like what, now it's it's almost twenty years old. Yeah, uh -huh, and, and uh -huh. it's it's still like pushing hard in Korea. Yeah. Like, Starcraft Two has fallen below it like three years ago, mm -hmm. and it, it just never caught on as hard as Brood right. War. Right. Still to see. Today. Yeah. I just watched a tournament out of China where these guys from Norway went over, and it was like a. $10,000 prize cool. for Age of Empires 2. Just like, Dude, I mean, one of the biggest... China does a lot with Warcraft 3 still as well. Yeah. One of my classes has challenged me to Age of Empires 2. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's funny because, Smash like, one of the biggest fighting games right now is still Smash Brothers Melee. Yeah. Right? Yes. Melee yeah, is... That game is, what, like 15 years old yeah. too? Yeah, so... And that game is... I feel like it's bigger now yeah, than it's, it's yeah, ever it's been, awesome, you know? Yeah. So, so there you go. So... Some, you can't you can't fight the classics, you know. Like for me, my favorite game is Super Street Fighter Two Turbo, which is like twenty years old now, and we still have tournaments for that. Like people still run side tournaments, and that makes me happy because, like I said, that's that's the game that I played when I was in college. Anyways, um, <laughs> but yeah, so um, yeah, the, the main really, honestly, the main thing is that this is a new field. So these are just kind of like things that I observed you know, over the course of just being involved in fighting games. Obviously, I don't know a lot of the other genres as well, and, you know, it, it's just something really interesting to keep in mind. You know, obviously, if you're designing one-player games, these are not things you have to worry about, but if there's ever any point in time where you do feel like creating a competitive game and you do feel like that this is like, hey, this could really become a, a real eSport, you know, this is a new area that we have to think about, and it's really about, you know, a lot of the spectatorship and such, so... Um, that's pretty much all I had in terms of that, and like I said, I kind of went longer than I thought I was going to, but I did definitely want to open up for questions, you know, if you guys have any questions about fighting games or just anything that I've been, you know, talking about here. Um, here, I saw you raise your um, hand. So how do you feel about, uh, some of the newer, um, recap and highlight technologies that are being incorporated into games like Overwatch, where... Mm -hmm. Personally speaking, as like a stream director, like the viewers only see so much of the game that goes on. Right. There's a lot of plays that are missed. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And games like Overwatch are now kind of hitting on that, where it's like there's this really impressive play, uh -huh, and whether uh -huh. you saw it or not, here it is. Right. Like, what, what's your take on that? Because like especially in shooters, you miss so much. There. Right, yeah. I mean, shooters are one of the hardest ones because there are so many different views. And so if you're watching one, something might be happening over there that you miss. Uh, for one thing, the Overwatch play of the game thing, I think is genius. Not only just from a, hey, get to check out this cool thing, but I mean, from a marketing standpoint, I mean, you go to your Facebook feed and it's just like, hey check out my play of the game check out my play of the game it's like free advertising right so it's like it's it's really it was a really really smart thing that they did but um i think uh and again this is something that you and i were talking about like building that into the game so that you can rewind so even for like a fighting game if something happens that's kind of hard to see you can go back and play it like frame by frame and then turn on like the hit boxes or whatever to show how things are interacting would be really cool and if they could do that in um i'm trying to figure out how they would i'm sure someone could build a tool for overwatch that they could do that outside of that i mean you could probably also have it be from just the production crew right so all eight views or uh, how many players are in an overwatch game uh, 12. 12 right so okay so all 12 views for example um, you'll be able to see every single view. Someone's going to be watching them and see something happen over there, but this one's live. They can go back and capture it. So from the broadcast standpoint, they could probably do that. But if it was built into the game where it's just like, oh, this something really cool happened, I'm going to hit a button, and then it captures the last 10 seconds, and then it stores it for you and stuff like that, that would actually be really, really nice, especially for the spectator point of view. I know a lot of the fighting game broadcasters have been focusing on replay stuff recently so that there's like highlights after a match is over so mm -hmm. yeah say, uh, i've seen it recently done with a few different games so they do re replays actually in game when it like kind of stalls out especially games that are a little slower like mm. in dota where they mm. have like times in the game where it's right, just, yeah. you know them farming or doing whatever and they're mm -hmm. kind of setting up for the things to happen um and 
uh, they'll like roll a replay of what just happened. Mm -hmm. Even if you saw it, they'll like like point out certain details. Right. Or if certain things happen across the map, like someone's you know split pushing top lane and they're right. fight dragon, they're gonna focus on the team fight because that's bigger. Mm -hmm. But then mm -hmm. they will replay what happened top lane because you mm -hmm. didn't see that, and it'll replay over the game while you know everyone's back at base. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. And, yeah. Um, that's been incorporated. I know in League and in Dota. Um, and even in StarCraft in certain instances. Do you, do you know offhand if that's something that's built into the it's game? It's not built into the game. It's so that's just the production. Yeah, we, okay. We brought up production, and that's why You're I was right. saying that the yeah. production crew has a lot to do with that, obviously. Yeah. Really so, I mean, that was... So, I know, for example, like, um, I wonder how much they could do that, because if they could re... If you could actually like rewind the game and watch it anywhere, you know, in game and be able to capture it directly like that, just to add the tools to help the broadcasters, that's another thing to think about too. You know, when when if you're especially if you're trying to make a game, particularly for esports, you know, trying to build all these tools in there to make it give as much information as possible. Like I said, it's it's all about being as spectator friendly as possible. So, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, as an industry, as esports. Mm -hmm. um, Um, personally, uh, what I'm most excited about, um, you know, one of the reasons why I like watching games done quick and, uh, and you know, a lot of, uh, well, I mean, like I said, I focus mostly on fighting games is I just really like seeing people be really good at video games, you know, and, and the thing about it is, is there's this reputation that, you know, gaming is, you know, a waste of time, you know, this kind of, oh, you know, it's whatever, you know, like, go outside and play, you know, kind of thing. But honestly, it's like to play a lot of these games requires so much skill and so much talent. And one of the things that I always talk about is if you watch a Sports Center highlight and let's say you see LeBron James like drive through the lane and dunk the ball, you're like, oh, he's athletic. That was amazing because they put him on the, the screen. But like to the common person, you can't go up to them and say, check out this clip from this fighting game. They're like, aren't they just mashing buttons? You know, like there's no natural assumption that these guys are really good at what they do. It, like to, to get good at these games like people are literally playing like six eight hours a day you know practicing analyzing their gameplay and so what it's exciting to me about esports getting bigger is just getting to the point where the public conscious kind of understands that this is actually a talented thing that this is something that people are good at and not everyone not anybody can do this you know it's really the people that take the time and are dedicated to it you know because even to this day when i tell people like oh i do commentary for tournaments at fighting games and they're like so what you know like they don't they don't understand it quite right so you know that's kind of what I'm personally excited about. And um, what was the second half of the question again? Well, it was just how, how you see it's going to grow. Oh. What, you, what is kind of like some indicators that you're looking at as far as growth? I mean, like Overwatch League is interesting. Right. Prize pool is getting, you know. It, that's, I mean, the trickiest thing about the, the, the whole industry right now is that it's really new and we're running into a lot like it's growing fast and it's great like so riot owns league of legends they run all the lcs they do all this stuff but then at the same time they're not kind of like uh, a major league baseball right where riot can just kind of make a bunch of decisions and just be like you know what this team is banned sorry you know because you this is an infraction sorry <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and and there's n there's no appeals process right there's none of that in there and so there's going to be a lot of growing pains through the esports industry before we can figure out how to get to that point where uh, things are a little more fair and such. So we're already seeing some of that happening. And I uh, honestly, like, if you told me five years ago that Evo would be broadcasting on ESPN2 from, like, the Mandalay Bay, I would have laughed at you. I would have been like, huh, yeah, right, I wish. Only in my dreams, right? And so I've always thought, like, by the time fighting games got that big, I'd be dead and buried, long gone, you know. And it's happening a lot faster than I thought. So my expectations are always slow and steady wins the race. But it's been surprising me as it keeps going, and it's growing way faster than I ever thought it was. Well, I see a lot of people putting a lot of money into yeah. teams, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the League of Legends. I mean, they have investors there yeah. looking at teams like they would have. Yeah, was it like uh, like Mark Magic? Cuban, yeah, Cuban. Magic Johnson Magic and Johnson, yeah, to Tony Fox. Robbins of yeah. all people like <laughs> bought a team recently. So I guess you can imagine if they're putting money in like that, they're gonna want to have yeah, uh -huh. exactly. Or, you know, that doesn't fluctuate so much. Also, mm -hmm. your team's out. 
Right, exactly. Yeah, I was, that's what I was going to ask you about as well, is if you've kept up with the League of Legends, LCS in particular, like, mm-hmm. what do you think of this current conflict that's going on right now where a lot of the teams are pushing for franchising because they have right. a current relegation system where teams can get knocked out and bring into the league mm-hmm. um, new mm-hmm. teams, and that's how you know, you're know you swapping in talent and all that. Uh, but teams currently that are in there are already you know breeding new talent through second teams, doing this right, type of thing, right. trying to bring people in, but they are afraid to acquire – or. Sponsorships are hard to acquire because mm-hmm. of the possibility that they lose their spot. <laughs> right. So there's like a certain amount of risk associated, and it's hard for them to make money past what Riot gives them, which is right. very low. But Riot does salary their players, yeah, the, the uh-huh. players, but they don't have. Um, it's not as much as they need to run a business, mm-hmm. which is like what mm-hmm. these organizations are. Right. And they, they actually recently sent a letter into Riot, like nine out of the ten teams, asking for franchising because they right. want their spot locked in so that they can get these big sponsors. <laughs> I was wondering if you had. Anything I, I you about. know, I really. So I, if you guys watch me do uh, fighting game commentary, I usually do it with Ultra David, uh, and uh, he's a lawyer for, and he does esports stuff, and he's all involved in this whole entire thing. Man, if he was here, he would be like, push me aside. All right, here we go. Let me let me tell you about this right now. Uh, unfortunately, like my knowledge on that whole situation is probably not strong enough for me to really give as informative of an opinion that I would like. Um, it's kind of interesting because the fighting game community is kind of having some interesting situations too because all the games are made by different companies and so there's not one company but then people are like shouldn't we have a governing body to have like all these rules and everything and it's it's a tough balance right because as soon as you get a governing body they may have too much power so there's got to be a way to balance that out and um, you know f- for for something like League of Legends, I do hope that they can figure out a way to do it. And, you know, kind of going back to one of what my measures for success is, is, you know, I would like to see people who are good at video games, you know, I don't want them to be blisteringly wealthy or whatever like that, but it's like if they can just make a living off of what they're doing comfortably, and so to the point where when they stop playing, they still have stuff that they can do, you know, that, that they still have an industry to be in. They could be coaches, analysts, commentators, whatever. That's kind of my goal, right? And so whatever Riot can do to get to that point so that the teams, the players, and everybody can feel safer and more comfortable that they're making the right decision. Because the worst thing, I, don't, I like I said, I've been playing video games for my whole life. And the last thing I want to do is tell people, video games are awesome. They go play video games, esports, and then they like get like carpal tunnel they can't play anymore and then that's it that like they they ha- like you're not going to walk into like a job interview and be like i'm the greatest starcraft player you know like it just like i don't want that to kind of thing to happen i want these people to be able to feel like they made the right decision by going into there and so um if whatever riot can do to give that kind of uh security and comfort to the players i think is really important yeah that was a big debate um i have a follow-up question about mm-hmm. like, uh, caster wages um, because there was also another thing about that. You heard about how some of the freelancers denied their uh, mm-hmm. denied Riot's request for them to come because mm-hmm, they, mm-hmm. Yeah. They're, they're not paying enough. That would right. be a fair wage. Um, <laughs> do, do you like have any like? thoughts on that like uh, standardization of like you know yeah i mean well i mean i'm sh- i don't know the numbers for those casters but i, I I'll, i'd probably take it right now <laughs> 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 not as much money on the fighting game community right now i'll just put it that way so no for sure it i mean it's funny because even as a commentator when i first started doing commentary i thought we were the least important part. Like I thought the organizers, I thought the players, I thought the broadcasters, the the, the actual streamers mm-hmm. were the most important parts. But the, the longer this goes, the more I do this, I start to realize how important commentary really is because it really is there to tell the story, to bring the people in. So whenever I do commentary, I because fighting games are always new, I, I never know how many people watching are veterans or how many are new but i'm always going to skew towards the newer players first because i want to make sure i appeal to the wider audience as much as i can and bring them in you know so um i do realize that commentary is pretty important um i'm not saying like i'm the most important person like no i mean like any of the commentators are very important and uh it's really their job to help tell the story so uh, again, I, I don't. I'm not like. I don't think casters should make any more than anybody else. I'd like to see the you know the rising tide, bri- ri- you know, uh, what's the quote? Rising tide lifts all ships. Yeah, lifts all ships. Basically, you know, I would like to see it go up for everybody. And um, but again, this is just one of those things. As people uh, continue to figure this out, 
you know, I, I feel like we're going to get more standards and everything like that. Because the, the hardest part right now is that all of those salaries and everything are hidden. They're behind closed doors. Nobody knows what anything is. Mm -hmm. And, like, probably at some point it might benefit if it all just kind of was more in the open so people kind of knew in that yeah, way. People always speak in relatives. It's like, yeah. It's like paying about half of what I make here. And it's like, well, half of what? Right, exactly, exactly. So, you know, once it gets to that point, you know, hopefully they'll – even for, like I said, the commentators, you know, or, or analysts or hosts or anything, you know, hopefully it'll get to the point where they can feel like that they're doing this and not, and, and not regret going into this decision, going into this field, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you mentioned the, you know, you compared like traditional sports to esports. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And one of the things as a developer I'm looking at is my footballs, my basketballs, my NASCARs, the playing field and the rules are consistent, mm -hmm. right? You deflate a football and we go insane, <laughs> right? But as a developer, as a video game developer, it's my job to continually balance and change yeah. and tweak this game. Mm -hmm. So you're putting esports players in a situation where it's not, it's skill versus skill, obviously, mm -hmm. but as the environment changes around them, you see that as a, a good thing, a bad thing? Because that's one thing that traditional sports has going for it. Every year they might get together the rules committee and say we're going to move right. the field goal, uh -huh, uh -huh. we're going to move the extra point. Yeah. But now for this year it is consistent. Mm -hmm. Everybody is the same, and mm -hmm. it's a pure skill versus skill. Whereas, you know, call it feature of the month or call it whatever, mm -hmm. people pick video games apart and they find that advantage yeah. in the system. And then I come in as a developer and I take that away from. Them. <laughs> is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it um, so is it hurt growth, help growth? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so this is a big issue in fighting games. So one of the uh, fighting games that's really popular right now was Mortal Kombat X, and uh, they released patches all the time. Like it was like one month, and then two months later is the next patch, and a month later here's another patch, and it actually really hurt. The, the competitive scene. A lot of players are like, I, you know what, you keep changing my character, I can't keep up with all these changes. You've been practicing for three months now. Right, uh -huh. so like uh, right before EVO, uh, not this year, but the previous year, one there was a new DLC character that came out and was super powerful and she beat up everybody. And so like the, the seven days before EVO, they came out with a new patch to try to prevent that character from dominating EVO. And yeah, a lot of people were really upset about that. They were just like, what the heck? You changed it right before like the biggest tournament of the year? And they were kind of frustrated with that. And uh, I think uh, I do like patching because obviously w one of the greatest things about playing video games is exploiting them, right? I mean, like AGDQ, fighting games, everything. It's like find that bug that totally lets you sequence skip or do whatever, you know, and you just feel awesome for being able to pull these things off. And um, Sometimes you're, I mean, no, not even sometimes, all the time, okay? You're going to find something that the developer did not intend, right? Something's going to show up and it's going to give you maybe a potentially unfair advantage. I think on a case-to-case -case basis, if it's so broken that it ruins the game, I think it's go okay to patch, like, right away just for the sake of, of helping it because it's just that one small thing. But if it's just something like, for example, in Street Fighter V, a lot of people were like, Chun-Li is the best character, right? She's like the best character right now. But it's interesting because like she hasn't won as many tournaments as people would think she would have if she were that good. And over the months, it changes a little. So Street Fighter V right now, what I like what they're doing is they haven't changed much in the game at all. And they're waiting till this year is done until this Capcom Pro Tour year is done. Then they'll change it, and then for the next year, they'll try to leave it that way as much as possible. Um, I think if it's kind of done like that, if we know when the patch is coming, if it's scheduled, like every three months, here's the next patch, then people know as soon as that patch drops, whatever I practice will stick for three months, and then the next patch will come, and okay, I can adjust. And as long as they know, and as long as they can expect it, it's better than if you're just dropping things on them all of a sudden out of nowhere. And then also, and not enough games do this, patch notes. Please, just like, here's all the things that we changed. Like, that's really, really nice to have. So, yeah, go ahead. So then would you say that um, more communication on the developer side, as well as better timing, would help? Because uh, from the organization standpoint, like, I'm the person that was updating 76 Xboxes because they <laughs> released a patch yes. a day before our tournament. Oh, my God, um, yeah. Uh -huh. So would you say, like, not releasing patches right before major events or at least notifying people of 
the the impacts it may have. So like, yeah. we're gonna change this character. Be warned, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. uh, this isn't gonna be as powerful as it's going or as it currently is. Like some heads up on yeah. this is gonna affect your play style. Try to work around it. Mm -hmm. Would that be like something that would help out? Yeah, like, yeah, a absolutely. Again, it's just as long as there's a consistency and 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 a, and a level of expectation. Yeah, I mean, I've heard countless stories of people having to patch patch like um, over a hundred consoles for an event uh, that's coming up and in fact uh, for the fighting game community there's one particular group called gaming generations that like everyone rents all the consoles from so thankfully you know not for them but for TOs like they're the ones who, that are responsible for for updating those things but it's still I mean, it's tough for for something like the fighting game community. There's obviously like the big events, like Evo's coming up. So don't do this right before Evo. But man, like this last month and a half, I've been like going all over the place. There's been like five events in six weeks. So it's hard to find a time where you might not hurt a tournament. But if you did say like a month ahead of time, like, hey, look, we're sorry, this is the time that it's going to be put out, right? Um, that definitely helps a lot. And like I said, the patch notes helps a lot too because. As long as it's everything we know is going to change is out there, then we can already, uh, you know, even before the patch comes out, we can start theory crafting at least, you know. So uh, back there. Right. Yeah. Uh, there's definitely been some fighting game tournaments where a patch came out like two days before and they just won't hook up the console to the to the internet just so it won't download any of the patches and yeah, that way they can keep it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was going to say, that even helps, that's where like developer support comes in. So like example, like League of Legends, like most, most probably every like major league tournament that's run is backed by Riot. Mm -hmm. example, right. Community, you'll have whoever develops your fighting game. So it sucks that for games like the Nintendo, right? They don't, I guess they've shown they don't really support like like yes, yeah, it's so, weird. I'm, I think they're turning around, but uh, I'm not sure just yet. So, I money. yeah, I mean, well, because like the interesting thing about Nintendo is like they haven't really like s supported Smash as heavily as you'd like it to. But then you guys all saw the Nintendo Switch trailer, right? And at the end, there's like this big esports arena with Splatoon yeah. going on there, and it's, so it's like, hmm, what's Nintendo thinking now? Like maybe they're getting on board with this esports thing. So yeah, I was gonna say I think the developers being on board is a really good big step because like oh, yeah. you look at the mm -hmm. games that are successful and they have full developer support and, mm -hmm. and the League of Legends being the biggest one right, right. because so they run two big tournaments a year and mm -hmm. they have an off season and the off season is when those big patches right are yeah uh -huh. and that's like the perfect time because you give people what two months before the next major right. of you know mm -hmm. season starts and you have uh, all that time to, to prepare right. for the big changes they made yeah. in the game and, it, and every other patch is generally just smaller like fixes to the games, mm -hmm. like broken mechanics. Right, yeah. I mean, the, the one thing about that, though, that makes it a little tricky is only that, you know, like I said, I like it when the developer is involved. And in fact, a lot of the American developers for fighting games are really involved. Honestly, like, uh, Capcom Japan, Nintendo Japan are a little bit more disconnected than, like, with, like, Warner Brothers and NetherRealms with Mortal Kombat and such like that. Um, it's changing. That's changing. But then, again, there also comes to that point where Riot might have a little bit too much power, you know, because they can just kind of do whatever they want. So um, what's interesting about like sports like basketball and Major League Baseball is that like it's, the yeah, it's kind of, right, they get, it's kind of disconnected. Like they can't just like be like, oh, well, no, you know, you're banned. And like there's appeals process. Like even for stuff like, oh, I got another flagrant foul and now I'm fined, you can appeal that, you know, like these kind of systems need to be put in place but at the same time absolutely 100 percent agreed like developer uh interaction is very very important mm -hmm. cool we're out of time so i'm gonna just kill the recording but we'll still answer questions and still be here i just if we get kicked out of the room i don't want to have to do all the recording stuff while they're coming in oh uh, okay so i'll okay. just exit the recording and sure. still answer questions so okay well kind of keep going but i'm just gonna i'll just say uh, just on the recording here before we stop i'll just say thanks and uh if you guys want to like shameless plug you can follow me on twitter at jay chenzor or ultra chen tv so you can uh, follow either one of those and uh you can keep asking me questions there even after i'm gone so. <laughs> awesome. thank you, okay. thank you.